All right, welcome again, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. I am Lauren Skinner with Convey Compliance, and joining me today is John Adams, Product Manager with Convey. Today, John's going to provide you with some information on how to comply with new information re reporting requirements for incentive stock options and employee stock purchase plans, also known as Forms 3921 and 3922. John will walk you through who needs to file these forms, what these new forms are used for, and provide tips and tricks for completing these forms. At the end, we're going to open it up for questions and answers. Another note is before we begin, I'd like to let you know that if at any time during the presentation you'd like to submit a question, please type it in the questions box, again on the panel of the right-hand side of your screen. Please note that other participants cannot see your questions and our presenters will review all the questions and respond during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Now to get started, we are going to offer a polling question. The question is, which employee stock program does your company offer? Incentive stock options, employee stock purchase plans, both or neither? I'll give you a minute to respond. Great, thank you. And while I'm calculating the results, I'm excited to announce that we have set a date for next year's C2 Summit. The 2011 C2 Summit will be at the Omni Shoreham Hotel in Washington, D.C., September 28th through the 30th. Convey's Complain Connect C2 Summit is a live information reporting seminar with two and a half days of regulatory compliance and Convey solution sessions. Please mark your calendar and feel free to update or visit our c2summit.convey.com for more information. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to John. Thank you, Lauren, and good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to our presentation for this afternoon. Forms 3921 and 3922, we're going to talk about the ABCs of incentive stock options and employee stock purchase plans. Just real quick on the poll, um, based on how you all responded this afternoon, uh, it's well over half of you that are either offering an incentive, an incentive stock option plan or an employee stock purchase plan or both. Uh, there's a handful of you that responded that your uh, company is not offering either one. Um, from that, I can only infer that maybe your maybe your organization is planning on it, or you're just simply trying to determine uh, what are the uh, rules and requirements around filing these forms. And to that extent, I'm sure we'll be able to answer that for you uh, in today's webinar. So, the, a little bit of uh, information on the uh, the origin and the historical timeline that led up to Forms 3921 and 3922. The Tax Relief and Health Care Act of 2006 amended the information reporting requirements of the Internal Revenue Code, Section 6039, by imposing an additional requirement that employers also file an annual information return with the IRS with respect to the exercise of incentive stock options. The IRS subsequently waived the additional filing requirement for exercise options and stock transfers that occurred in tax years 2007, 2008, and 2009, and thus no information returns were required to be filed directly with the IRS 
for transactions that occurred in 2009 and prior tax years. So if anyone was maybe knew a little bit about the rules um, but was wondering why are we not hearing about it until now, uh, it's because of those prior year waivers uh, that basically deferred the need to do the filing. Um, and the IRS has eventually in 2010 gotten around to finalizing the forms. Um, the final forms were issued in October of this year and now must be used to report for tax year 2010. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, until 2006, stock options were simply reported in the notes section of the financial statements for your company in accordance with the GAAP or generally accepted accounting principles rules, um, but did not impact the company's financial statements. In 2006, FAS 123 of the GAAP code was modified to require companies to show options as an expense on the company's income statement. This means that the cost of these options would now be shown as employee compensation along with salaries and other expenses. So now beginning in January 2011, or early next year, employers must begin providing detailed transaction information to employees who have exercised incentive stock option or ISOs or transferred shares purchased under employee stock purchase plans, ESPPs, during 2010. They must also file with the IRS. Although employers have been providing this information to employees who exercise ISOs or bought shares under an ESPP since 2006, the IRS, as I mentioned, had waived the requirement to file with them for all the years through 2009, so the requirements will first apply to ISO exercises and transfers of ESPP shares that occurred during 2010. The information contained in these information returns should ensure that employees will have sufficient information to calculate their tax liability with respect to the disposition of shares acquired under an ISO or an ESPP. The new reporting requirements go into effect for stock transfers that occurred during 2010. Thus, it is important that you prepare now to collect the information that you must report. Presumably, you've been collecting the necessary information in order to fulfill the reporting requirements to your employees, and while there is no substantive change to what must be reported, now that corporations must report to this, this information to the IRS, it is even more important that you make every effort to collect and report the information fully and accurately so you don't incur any penalties. So who must file? The IRS has some very carefully worded instructions regarding who must file the new forms, but in general, with very few exceptions, in fact, only one that I could note, if your company grants stock options to its employees and or if it offers its employees a stock purchase plan, you will likely need to file Form 3921 and or Form 3922 when those employees either exercise those options or purchase your company's stock at a discount through your company's employee stock purchase plan. But this is not an entirely new process. If you've offered these programs in prior years, you've been required to send statements to your employees regarding these transactions for those years. The difference now is you need to expand your reporting process and adopt using the new forms as well as reporting this information to the IRS. And I think it's also worthwhile to note that while we've been talking about ISOs and ESPPs, there is a uh, different and uh, distinct program called an Employee Stock Ownership Plan, or ESOP, just to add one more acronym uh, to this webinar, trying not to really confuse you, but really wanting to bring this up. ESOPs, Employee Stock Ownership Plans, are not covered by these new reporting rules. So if anyone was wondering about that or if thinking maybe uh, ESOP and ESPP are maybe just the same thing by a different name, um, they are distinctly different 
Um, and if you if you need additional clarification on that, uh, recommend consulting with your tax advisor because they are separate plans. So a little bit of information around uh, reporting thresholds, reporting deadlines, um, and any exceptions that may exist uh, to the new reporting rules. First of all, dollar amount thresholds for Forms 3921 and 3922 are not the same as thresholds for some 1099 forms like 1099 miscellaneous. For 1099 miscellaneous, for example, reporting is required if the aggregate payment amount for the year is $600 or more. This is not the case for these new forms. Any amount must be reported because the form reports on shares of stock transferred and the associated value of the stock with no lower limit on the value of the stock. I think that's really important to point out. So uh, you know, if you get all the way down to a dollar, or you know, according to the rules, it's not even limited to a dollar. Whatever that amount is for that stock purchase or stock transfer, it needs to be reported. As far as deadlines go, forms must be postmarked by January 31st when they're being mailed out to your employees or recipients. The transmittals must be submitted to the IRS by February 28th if you're filing on paper, and by March 31st, if you're filing electronically. So that's one thing to note right away, is you can get yourself quite a bit more time if you choose to file electronically versus filing on paper. I also want to note, for your benefit, hopefully, that 30-day extensions to the deadlines are permitted and can be requested on paper or through the IRS's FIRE system and no signature or even explanation is required when requesting an extension. If you're familiar with extension rules on, uh, on 1099 forms, for example, this will sound familiar to you. Now, there is one exception to the rules about who must receive a form. Specifically, non-resident alien, where your company has not provided a Form W-2 wage and tax statement during the same time period that the ISO and or ESPP grants and exercise options occurred. And that part is really important. It has to be during the same time period. It can't be that you didn't do a W-2 in 2008 and 2009, but you did in 2010. It's the year or years in which these transactions occurred and it has to be at the same time that you did or did not issue a W-2 wage and tax statement. <clears throat> Finally, uh, for stock transfers that occurred during 2010, the returns are due on January 31st, 2011. And we've been alternating back and forth talking about tax year 2010 and reporting in 2011. And sometimes those, those dates can be mixed up a little bit. So we're talking about, uh, for the new rules and the new forms, reporting on incentive stock option transfers and employee stock purchases that occurred in tax year 2010, you'll need to report on that in the January through March timeframe in 2011. So now let's take a look at the different forms and talk about the information that is required on each of them. Uh, for Form 3921, if you had been following uh, the drafts that the IRS had been publishing for comment, um, it is important to note that if you're familiar with those draft copies, um, the final version is actually not any different than the draft. So to the extent that you'd already done some analysis and looked those over, uh, you won't see any surprises here because the final version is not any different. So for incentive stock options, uh, the Form 3921 requires the following information. The name, address, and employer identification number, or EIN, of the corporation that's transferring the stock. For many of you, that's probably the company that you represent. Um, 
Also, an account number is required if you have multiple accounts for an employee. And that, in addition to that, the IRS actually encourages you to designate an account number for all forms that you file. Um, they, uh, they would actually prefer that you do that, but they're, they're only re you're only required to do it uh, where, you're, where you have multiple accounts for a single employee. Um, if it is different from the above, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, next, the next area where you need to include information is the name, address, and the um, uh, employee's ID number uh, that the shares were transferred to under the exercise of these options. Um, box one should be the date that the option was granted to the employee. Box two is the date that the employee exercised the option to purchase the stock. Now, many times this can be years later as options become vested. So uh, when you're looking at the difference between box one and box two, um, it is often going to be the case that those dates are quite a bit different. Box three is the exercise price per share. So that's how much the uh, the employee exercise the, the price that the employee exercised uh, when they purchased those shares. Box four should include the fair market value per share for the stock on the exercise date. And box five is the number of shares transferred under the exercise. Now corporations like yours will find that the list above from the 2009 final regulations, which are the new regulations, is essentially identical to the list that was provided in the old regulations. In fact, there's only one difference. Under the new regs, corporations must report the exercise price per share. The old regs required only that the corporation report the total exercise price paid for the year. The extra, I'm sorry, the IRS made this change um, to essentially help employees um, better um, report and identify um, their cost basis per share. So now let's take a look at Form 3922. Uh, for Form 3922 is for employee stock purchase plan reporting. And the final regs indicated the following fields and, and boxes of information are required. Again, we have the name, address, and identifying number of the company that issued the stock. For many of you, again, that's probably the company that you represent. The name and address and employee identification number of the corporation. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. The um, employee's name and address of uh, the person who received the stock. Again, the account number is required. Same rules as I mentioned earlier. Um, if you have multiple accounts for an employee, um, you are required to have an account number for that employee. But again, the IRS does encourage you to assign an account number for each employee uh, and include that on all of the forms 3922 that you file. Now, box one on the form is the date that the option to purchase the stock was granted to the employee. And box two is the date that the employee purchased the stock. Again, many times these dates will be very, very different. Um, oftentimes because the, uh, the option plan could be spread out over uh, maybe several years. And so the, there's can be quite a bit of difference from when an option was granted to when an an employee finally exercised that option and purchased the stock. Boxes three and four should be the fair market value of the stock on the grant as well as the exercise dates. Box five is the exercise price paid per share on the date listed in box two. And boxes six and seven are the number of shares and the date that the legal title of the shares was transferred. Now, the, the date the legal title of the, of the shares being transferred, um, while it may seem like that could be repetitive, 
to the other date that you reported. Sometimes there's actually a lag from when shares are purchased until shares are actually legally transferred. And the expectation here is that you will re actually report the legal date of the share transfer and not just assume that it's actually the same date that the shares were purchased. Companies like yours will find that the list, again, from that we've just reviewed uh, from the new regs um, is an expansion of the list provided in the old regs. The old regs did not require reporting the date of the grant or the fair market value of the stock on the grant date and the exercise date, the exercise price, or the, ex uh, the exercise date or the exercise price. Um, again, the IRS expanded the list in order to provide sufficient information to your employees to enable them to calculate their tax obligations. So let's move on to some recommendations around the use of these forms. As I mentioned in uh, my opening remarks on, the, on an earlier slide, because you're now going to be reporting this information not just to your employees, but also to the IRS, as with other information reporting forms, valid name and TIN combinations are necessary. Now, you may be in pretty good shape because uh, in, in most instances, these are likely employees of your company who are receiving W-2 um, wage income. And so in all likelihood, you've already gone through the exercise of verifying that you have accurate name and TIN information. But it is important to note that you can be penalized if you're reporting on bad name TIN combinations, just like you can with other information returns. So it does merit taking a look and confirming that the information you have on these folks is indeed correct. In addition to that, um, as a company, if this is a, because this is a, a new program that's being rolled out and employees are gonna be receiving these forms, as a way to maybe preempt a lot of questions or confusion, um, you know, one of the things, or actually there's a couple of things you can do. Um, consider when you're sending the forms to uh, include some form of um, explanation within the mailing that just basically says, you know, you're getting this form and here are the reasons why and explain to them, put it in a context that's meaningful for them so that they don't just get it, maybe wonder about it, maybe assume that it's not anything that they had to worry about. Um, because it's, it's definitely important that they know that the same information is be report, being reported to the IRS and that they are expected to include that when they file. Uh, and, you know, related to that, maybe you even want to consider um, some sort of um, company-wide educational event where you can bring folks together and talk to them about what these changes are and do a Q&A and give people an opportunity to really understand, you know, what it's all about. Next point of consideration, um, in, some, in some cases, maybe these uh, uh, incentive stock option or employee stock purchase plans are really um, made available just to uh, a certain group of employees within the company, maybe a board of directors uh, or an ex executive management team. And you need to talk about how do you wanna manage that information within your company? What if people have questions? Who are they going to call? How are we going to manage this information internally? It may not be the case that the same folks that field questions for 1099 miscellaneous are the same people that you want to have dealing with Form 3921 and 3922 information. Ask yourself those questions and decide what, how you want to manage that uh, beforehand. In addition, you know, consider putting together an FAQ, uh, some frequently asked questions that you can publish to help people understand what they're for. Uh, maybe set up a separate phone number that's dedicated to questions on these forms with people who are trained to respond to these questions versus just having people, again, call into the general call center with their basic questions. Um, also, um, human, your human resources department, if you have a, a dedicated area, that could be a good place to manage these types of inquiries. And finally, some considerations as you think about how you're going to um, manage the process of uh, producing these forms and getting them printed and mailed and filing with the IRS. Uh, just a couple of things to think about and consider. Depending on 
the nature of your programs and uh, the, the way the transaction detail is shaking out. Uh, one of the things that you might want to think about is um, the ability to create your forms with some kind of print roll-up. Um, and by that, I'm talking about being able to include transaction details on a separate page as an alternative to issuing multiple separate forms for each transaction. I'm just going to hop ahead real quick and show you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. For Form 3921, I'm showing an example where on the top you can see the form, um, but separately below is a, a transaction detail list. So instead of creating individual forms that have unique data in each box, you'll note here the approach is to place asterisks in those boxes that reference the details um, in the list below. So this can be um, an alternative again, and it can be uh, um, a cost savings uh, and efficiency uh, creating process if you have multiple forms uh, that might be sent to the same recipient. Similarly, on Form 3922, kind of the same approach. And I just wanted to show you what those might look like. I'm just going to go back to that, that previous slide. Um, other things to consider uh, when it comes to printing forms, um, what I call print notes, the ability to put a special phone number or even contacts uh, or reference a website for FAQs, again, to direct people to where they can go if they have questions or need additional information about how to use these forms or what they're for. Uh, if you're considering a, a vendor uh, to uh, help you with this process, um, think about things like, uh, is it just software or are printing, inserting envelopes and postage, is that part of the service included? Is electronic filing with the IRS a service that's included? Um, are these forms supported for electronic delivery to employees? It's not in the rules yet, but we believe that it's likely that it will be. So if you are thinking about or looking at electronic delivery of these forms, uh, we want you to take these forms into consideration as well. Uh, and finally, uh, I would be risk, remiss if I didn't mention that Convey does indeed have solutions that can help you. Uh, we have software as a service applications that have form validations and print and IRS transmit service built in. Uh, and we have two different solutions. One is called Taxport, which many of you who are attending today probably are already familiar with or even using, as well as Taxport AP, which is our most recently uh, added application designed for accounts payable professionals. And with that, we'll open up the uh, very small amount of time we have left for a brief Q&A, and I thank you for your attendance today. Thanks, John. Everyone, we're just going to take a, a brief moment to review a couple questions and be right back with you. Okay, so the first question is, um, are these requirements for W-2 employees only? Uh, and the person is noting that they have board members with options that are 1099 miscellaneous for their board services. Would the new requirements apply to board members? Yeah, so what I was clarifying earlier when I was noting the one exception actually has to do with if you have non-resident alien employee and adding that additional qualifier of W-2. So it's, it's not saying that the W-2 applies, that that rule only applies. It's just using that as a qualifier if you have non-resident alien employees. And I hope that helps clear that up for you. Uh, let's see here. Next question, um, can you please explain the account number field? Um, no, I'm, I'm not talking about multiple broker accounts necessarily. Um, it's simply assigning a unique account number to your employees, and the primary reason for that in this context is if you have multiple events where you're going to be reporting on a Form 3921, the IRS is asking that you assign separate and unique account numbers for that employee, and I think it's primarily so that they can identify uniquely those separate events versus them all being treated as, as occurring together. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of I'll leave it at that. 
Uh, next question. Um, when will the 3921 and 3922 forms be made available in Taxport? And uh, I believe those are coming out in our December release or later later this later in December, but they will be they're, they're, I'm sorry, they I think they're already out there. And so I guess if you haven't seen it or if you have questions about that, um, just call customer support and they can direct you to where you can find that information. Okay, uh, got time for just two more questions. Um, here's a question. Is there such a thing as backup withholding for these types of payments? That's a really good question, um, and there, there's some confusion around that. Um, the answer is no. You don't have to worry about backup withholding for these transactions, essentially because there's not cash transfers going on here. So backup withholding does not apply. However, as I noted earlier, your company can still incur penalties if you file bad name TIN information. So it's important that you uh, take a look at that and make sure that that data is clean. And last question here before we wrap things up. Um, if an employee has multiple grant dates and then makes several exercises, can we report them on a single form and just pick one date? So uh, I guess we kind of touched on this in a roundabout way. Um, the IRS requires a separate report, a separate form for each grant and exercise date. So the values can be determined for each transaction. However, that kind of ties back to where I was talking about considering a, a solution that can do what I call print roll-up or a form that has a transaction detail associated with it. That's a great way of managing that. In the absence of that, you will have to produce and send separate forms for each of those scenarios. I think that's all we have time for today. Great, thank you, John. I would just like to make a quick announcement that in the next few business days, you will receive an email um, that will give you access to a recorded version of this webinar, as well as access to a PDF version of the slides. So again, look for that email in your inbox. One other quick note is I'd like to remind you again about Convey C2 Summit. That's September 28th through the 30th next year at the Omni Shoreham Hotel in Washington, D.C. And then last but not least, I'd like, you, like to invite you to join us at our last webinar for the calendar year. It is on December 15th, and we can, we'll be talking a little bit more about um, how you can reduce the cost for your 1099 print and form delivery. And in the meantime, if you do have any other questions or want to learn a little bit more about Convey, please send us an email at info at convey.com or just give us a call at 888-303-1099. On behalf of Convey, I'd like to say thanks and have a great rest of your day.